You are about to see Colleen Sisk speaking at the UC Santa Cruz Kresge Seminar Room on Friday, April 18th, 2014. The event was hosted by the UC Santa Cruz Common Ground Center, Education for a Just and Sustainable World. To find out more, visit kresge.ucsc.edu backslash common ground. My name is Pat and I'm of mixed European ancestry. Um, and I'm part of a group called Santa Cruz Indigenous Solidarity. And um, of course, the, the main reason we're here is that Colleen Sisk of the Widow and Wintu tribe is, um, has made a special trip down to Santa Cruz for two events today. This is one of them. Uh, she wanted to address a student audience uh, when she was in town. And so that's why this got set up. Um, and then there's a bigger event this evening at 6.30 PM at the Resource Center for Nonviolence, where Colleen will be speaking um, this feature film called Dancing Salmon Home about their tribe and their journey to try to restore salmon to their watershed. It's going to be shown. And there's also going to be an Ohlone, um, Ohlone and Selena speaker, actually a couple of Ohlone speakers um, at that event. So it's going to be a really special night and you're all very welcome to come. There's flyers on both ends of the room here at um, 6.30 p.m. Anyway, um, so uh, does anyone know whose ancestral homeland we're on right now? I know you do. <laughs> Ohlone. Um, and so, yes, um, we're on the, the homeland of Owaswas speaking Ohlone people here. Um, and uh, the descendants of, of those people are, are still alive and are still culturally active. Um, there's a number of tribes, Ohlone, Ohlone tribes, that uh, have ancestry that they trace back to the Santa Cruz mission and to this area. Um, the Amamutsin tribe is one of them and they're active here on campus. Um, and also the uh, Kosano and Rumson Carmel tribe uh, as well. Um, and someone from that tribe will be speaking this evening. Um, and also I want to say that we are uh, within the watershed of Wilder Creek, Cave Creek here and then Wilder Creek. And that Wilder Creek has a recovering population of steelhead, um, which are basically a, a kind of salmon. Um, they're in, in ocean uh, and freshwater. Um, life cycle, and they, uh, there was a dam removed on Wilder Creek around 2000, and they've come back and been spawning in the upper reaches, and so we're in a salmon watershed right now. Um, and I also want to say just about the university is that, uh, you know, Ohlone people were living on this land um, less than 200 years ago, um, you know, in, in a, a really deep relationship with this place, and we're here for thousands of years, and so, um, you know, their story is, is very interwoven with this land and this place. Their sacred places um, are, are all over this campus. There's places where there was um, like an upper campus, like there's a dance house hit um, where there used to be a dance house. Um, there's, there's a lot of really important cultural sites and uh, this campus is built in a really sacred land. And so just um, I think it's really important that we, that we, that we try, to, try to understand that and try to walk here with respect. And also the university is planning to expand an upper campus in a way that would really violate the sanctity of that place. Um, and so uh, our group is, is part of a lot of efforts, kind of a long-term thing to really try to get the university to not build an upper campus. And that's, that's a related issue um, with, with indigenous people's sacred places. And so anyways, um, that said, I also just want to say, um, like, um, so our group, Santa Cruz Indigenous Solidarity, it's an all-volunteer, um, pretty informal group. And we really welcome more people to be involved. Um, and basically what we do is we organize direct support for um, indigenous struggles, mostly in California. Um, and, and, that's, that's look, and also in, in Arizona. And, and what that's looked like mostly is supporting uh, struggles around uh, burial sites and sacred places where there's, there's all these developments throughout California um, that are desecrating and picking up uh, the, the sacred burial sites uh, of, of the native people here with, with no respect. and um, the laws that govern that are, are ridiculously inadequate. And so um, that's constantly going on. Like actually, just last night, I got a message that um, down in LA, the Tongva people's homeland, there's a development that's about to dig up a burial site and people are trying to fight that. So we try to just be allies in, in those fights. And um, really, um, these struggles are so invisibilized. And so we really try to lend, um, lend a voice and uh, really try to um, help strengthen the, those efforts. 
um, to protect those places, um, really help to get the message out um, that, that really needs to be heard and, and to take action and to show up when there's requests for support. Um, and so, um, and, and from doing that work, um, I should say also that we are involved with um, supporting a community in northeastern Arizona called the Big Mountain or Black Mesa community of Dine people. Um, and they're, they're dealing with a massive coal strip mine and we go out there every year and um, work on the land and herd sheep and help them out to stay on their lands. And we'll be going out there uh, next month and um, people are very welcome to be part of that as well. Um, and if you're interested, um, talk to me or um, Burl, who's back there, who's also a friend of our group. Um, anyway, um, so that said, um, and just the general thing that I've gotten now doing this work is that, um, that I hear over and over is from, from Native people is that we all have a responsibility to know where we stand, um, to know um, whose ancestral homeland we're on, to know, to understand our position um, within the system, to understand, um, like, because, um, to understand that, that we're living in a legacy of genocide and colonialism, that our society here has basically an extracted every relationship with the land, um, that is destroying the life support systems of the earth. Um, and the Native people are very much alive, though um, that, that process of, of suppressing um, their struggle and um, invisibilizing them is very much still in effect. Um, <laughs> and so, um, so that we have a responsibility to understand our position within the system um, and to use whatever power and resources we have um, to support these struggles for survival. But to understand, you know, where, what is our position within the survival and liberation struggle of indigenous people? And that struggle is going on everywhere in the world. And everywhere I know in California, Native people are fighting and doing everything they can. They have very little resources. They have very little support. Um, and, and I think that we need to look at, you know, it's not about, when you, when you recognize those things, it's, it's really hard stuff to look at. Um, but it's not about feeling guilty or judging each other for what we are or aren't doing. Um, but we need to be finding ways to support each other, um, to support each other more, to be able to have the strength to really face these things and to find ways that we can meaningfully act to, to really change, um, change our relationship with the land and with the Native people um, away from being a colonial relationship. Hi, my name is Nadia. I was born here in California Indian Territory. I'm the daughter of um, Gustavo and Sylvia. And it's my great pleasure and honor um, to introduce Chief Kalyan Sisk. Um, she has traveled here from the McLeod River in Northern California to be with us today through traffic and a beautiful spring day. <laughs> and um, I just think we are so lucky to get to hear from her mouth this story and others. And it is um, with great respect and gratitude that I would like to welcome her here with us. Hestem Chali, Ukuwan Ilawi, Winamuntu Waiwaka, Ukuwan Chala Bim. I'm just saying that we're from. McLeod River and that you're my friends and I'm, I'm here to talk with you about these things. Um, you know, we've been here for a long, long time, my people. Uh, way before there was a state, way before there was an interstate, way before there were county lines and, and uh, state laws and uh, experts in the environment, <laughs> scientists that knew best about how to treat us. And I say us because we were part of the environment. We're a part of the natural movement in the lands. You know, we have a lot of different issues from uh, our sacred lands that should be oak groves who were kept out of now because they say it's successional um, movement of nature for the pine trees to move into our sacred oak groves. That's natural. It's like it's not natural. <laughs> if we were in the woods like we should be, there would be distinct oak groves because we keep them distinct oak groves. Just like the meadows were, can, were distinct meadows because the deer and the wolves kept them meadows. 
They didn't get overgrown like they are getting now. They're being encroached on like our, our oak groves are being encroached on. Nothing can eat from there anymore because of what scientists believe as natural succession. And, and they don't really understand what they're talking about, right? So <clears throat> I don't know if you have any questions particular to the, the film. Um, this is a slice in time, and it's our only protection, really, to um, protecting our right. We have no other way. We own nothing on that river anymore. They have uh, successfully removed us from the river <coughs> and taken uh, control of our sacred sites. This is the last sacred site that we actually have access to. The rest of the sites are all under the 26 miles of river that's under the lake now. And so this last puberty rock, because up above it is Canyon River. And if you've ever been in a Canyon River or whitewater, you know, it's a class four whitewater. And so you, you realize that there's not much living spaces around a river like that. You know, where the tributaries come in up above, there are uh, other village sites there. But our main uh, ceremonial sites was this point and down uh, to, the, to the, where the Pitt River and the Sacramento come, come together. Can you tell me what the federal recognition of tribes is all about? Is that, that just seems That is a, like a six million dollar question. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's just, you know, it's like the five civilized tribes remember that era? The five civilized tribes and everybody else could be just shoot, shot or uh, rounded up or whatever. And then it was the savages and the hang around the fort Indians, right? The hang around the forts were good, the savages were bad. Could still kill them. Well, now it, I think it's just federally recognized, and then it's up to you to decide. Well, if they're federally recognized, and I see those guys, and they look like they're Indians, right? They still look in Indians. They're acting Indians. They're doing Indian things. Um, so, what do we call them? The federal government does not have a legal term of unrecognized, with a description or a definition of what it means to be unrecognized. Only recognized has descriptions of their privileges that go beyond anybody who doesn't fit on that list. And so then they created this application process, right? You can apply to be a federally recognized tribe in the 80s, right? This was, this was established in the late 80s. Well, it started in the uh, 78. They refined it by 82 because one tribe actually got through the process. The Timbi Shoshone <laughs> is the only tribe in California ever to uh, surmount that process in 1979. And after that, they reschooled the process to include all seven criteria, and uh, the burden of proof is on the tribes. And you can't use. Um, any of the statements from the commissioners that were sent out to uh, investigate the situation of the tribes. And so it's been how many years? Like 38, maybe. No one else in California has ever surmounted the process. There are many, many tribes, as you know, the Ohlone, um, that are in this area and around, clear over into uh, almost to the, the valley area are the Ohlone uh, territories. And the Ohlone tribe has uh, submitted, one of the first tribes to submit uh, to the process and uh, provided over five foot of documentation of their existence here, their interaction here. They're uh, over, overthrown by the uh, churches, by the mission system and the treatment that they received from the mission system that kind of messed up their, their uh, bloodlines and their knowledge of who they were and where they were from because of the uh, forced labor camps that they were subjected to. So a few years ago, they got their denial, right? The first, I think they're the first tribe in California to actually be denied federal recognition in that process. They are in appeals. Um, as far as I know, uh, Rosemary Canberra has said that they have won their appeals, but the BIA still resists and will not follow through with what they're supposed to do, and they're still in this denial uh, windstorm, right? 
for us, Winnemum, my Grams was the leader at the time, right? Florence Jones was a Puyol element, was our leader. And she said, uh, when I was trying to explain this, right, that we need to apply, we, you know, there's a process back then. And she said, uh, why would we apply to be the people we are? And who would we be applying to? Will it be a big Winnemum Wintu Council that says, yeah, we know what Winnemums are supposed to be doing, and you guys, you know, if your uh, basket designs are right, or your fishing techniques are correct, or your dance regalia is put together the way it's supposed to be, and you don't have any kind of powwow stuff, then okay, right? So we should apply to people who know who we should be. But we're not applying to those people. We're applying to the federal government. So she said, why would we do that? We're not applying for a house loan or car loan. And if they tell us no, we just don't get the car, right? But what if they tell us no, we're not Winnemum? Then what are we? And I've posed that question to the BIA just recently during this time because they're saying, well, if you just get recognized, <laughs> right? It's like, why won't you recognize us then? <laughs> so we were recognized. And, and I asked them, it's like, what happens to tribes like the Ohlone or, at the time, um, Talawa Nation just got their denial letter? And to me, that was an alert system to say, you know, if Talawa Nation got denied, uh, they're like us, you know? They're up in the, in the uh, undeveloped areas. They're still on their river. They still have their ceremonial regalia. They still speak their language. They still have their songs and dances. It's real uh, prescriptive. It's not messed up by churches or movement or development or our sacred places have been all destroyed. It's a very clear roadmap of who they are and of who we are. And so at that time, I thought that was an alert thing that said, OK, you know, it's time for the California people California Indians to reject applying in this process because it doesn't work. After 30 years, don't you think we're tired? <laughs> Wouldn't they be tired? But these guys are so trained <laughs> that it's like, well, we put in all this work, we put in all this money. You know, we need to ride it out to the end. It's like, are you thinking that you look and act and feel and have a history stronger than what the Talawa have? Because if they can deny the Talawa, they're going to deny everybody else. Because it's not any more clear than that. So the process itself is not to recognize Indians. Otherwise, there'd be more Indians recognized by now, right? There's like 130 tribes applying in California. There's 110 tribes federally recognized in California from rancheria system that existed from the 20s. Those systems were set up by a Homeless Indian Act for homeless Indians, right? They were not set up for tribes. They were set up for homeless Indians. So when the, in the 1950s, then there was the Howard Wheeler Act to split up the reservations was their main and important part for the big reservations in the Midwest. They wanted to split those up and get the lands for gold and everything else. And so at that time, they did termination of these lands. And it was said to give you the title. Don't you want your own title to your land? So you can do whatever you want to with your land and, event, and split up all the land that was not uh, given out to the Indian people. So here in California, uh, they did that same thing to these homeless Indian lands. But they had to make assignments. And so, because the land didn't belong to any, any one Indian, they were homeless Indians. And so the government came in in the 50s and assigned allotments, they called them allotments, on the Indian, homeless Indian land that says, well, you get an acre allotment here, and you get an acre allotment here, and then do you want to sell your allotment? Because, you know, we're going to give you all this money right now, and we're going to put in water lines, and we're going to put in sewer lines, and we're going to upgrade this road, and you can own your own place. So people bought into it, right? Some of the people bought into it and signed away those rancheria lands. Well, they were terminated as Indians. That's what they gave up, their right to be Indian. 
anybody who didn't sign away was just shuffled off to the side and the entire rancheria was terminated. So in the 80s, uh, the Jesse Short case overturned uh, that decision because the BIA breached its promises of bringing in water lines, sewer lines, upgrading the electric, doing the roads, you know, a number of things. And so they become to unterminate those lands. And as they unterminated the lands, you have this uh, recognition thing in place, right? So instead of saying, like in my area, they unterminated the Redding Rancheria, which um, agreed to be terminated, right? The Indians there agreed to be terminated. So they unterminated them, and at that time, they made them the tribe, <laughs> and us not the tribe. So they took the homeless Indian lands and created tribes out of them. So they have no real sacred places, they have no real um, uh, language, you know, there are, there are multiple groups of people who live on these rancherias, um, and they, they are not functioning as tribes at that time. So they're working to try to be tribes. But even in that work, you know, we notice that um, they're missing a whole lot of uh, personal development as a tribe and understanding and uh, taking care of, of our people. And that's why we have a number of other issues with disenrollments and no trickle-down effects and no sharing of anything with the majority of the California Indians who are in this other, on this other slate over here that we're accepting as an unterminated or unrecognized. And even the recognized tribes feel like, oh, those guys are unrecognized because they got terminated. It's like, no, we've never been terminated. We've never been homeless Indians. How could we get terminated? Homeless Indians got terminated in California, not us. 90% of the California Indians are in that category. So the BIA only has like 38,000 Indians in California. Did you know that? It's only 38,000. And so it's a, it's, a, it's a big issue here. And what I uh, think is like, if we were a recognized tribe on that list, what you saw on this film would not happen. That's the privilege that a recognized tribe has over us, but they can't make us stop acting like Indians, right? And so they have to put up, I mean, the, and they did a pretty good job trying to squash us this last time with their boats and their, you know, uh, the whole process that they went through because we fought tooth and nail. Before this ceremony was held, we held the war dance on the river. And we had the Coast Guard boat up. We had the Sheriff's boat up every day. We had the Forest Service boat up, the Rangers. And we had a couple of helicopters a couple of the days. We had undercover people at the bridge. Um, and we only know that because one of our guys went down there with a gun, right? <laughs> He's a bird hunter. <laughs> it was a, it was a pellet gun. And so he got stopped under the bridge saying, hey, you know, about this gun. I was like, well, who are you guys? Well, they're, they're cops, right? They want to know what kind of gun he's carrying. <laughs> so we find out, you know, th that those guys up there, they're not just fishermen <laughs> fishing quietly under the bridge like, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll be dumb day. <laughs> but I feel like, um, you know, President Obama was supposed to have signed the declaration of um, indigenous people's rights, right? But during this time, we called upon that, saying that he signed the de that declaration, and the articles in that declaration gives us access to lands that we used to own, and those lands that help keep us our distinctive uh, tribal rights. And the federal government came back and said, oh no, that was just an aspirational policy that he signed. He'd like to aspire to that one day. But at this point in time, there are no direct uh, directives to the federal government to implement any of those articles 
And they don't anticipate that for at least 10 years. And unless the indigenous people of California actually push those articles, they probably never will. Because you have to bump up against, and you have to say these are important. I mean, it took 30 years to get those articles <laughs> signed by most of the countries. It'll probably be another 20 years before that's a common termino terminology for human rights. And, you know, it's a sad thing, is like most people know what human rights are, right? The human rights. And it took years for that to happen. And in, in other countries, they're still struggling uh, trying to enforce human rights. But the indigenous people, for the last 30 years, have been fighting for indigenous people's rights. And, and I think about that too, it's like, if there were human rights, how come we had to have indigenous people's rights? Because we're still not human in human rights. <laughs> we're still in the way of progress. We're still land, what is it, tree huggers. <laughs> the guy's like, we're on the water, what are you talking about, tree hugging? <laughs> Call us a frog or something. But, <laughs> but uh, these are, these are the, the future directions that, that we have you know, to look at as, as people here. It's like, and I always think, you know, it's like, you know, we're an endangered species. The only place that we will ever be Winnemum is on that river. That's the only place that Winnemums can learn how to be Winnemum. There's nowhere else in the world we can go. We can't go to Navajo and learn how to speak, be, pray, go to those sacred places in Winnemum. This is it. This is all there is. We don't have a country to go back to to hear everything about our people or see those places. You know, um, those places are, are like the Vatican. You know, when we go to those prayer places on the mountain, it's like going to the Vatican. It's that important to us that who would stand by and let them destroy the Vatican? You think, oh no, let's, let's just move that. You know, I think there's an oil well under here. It's like it could provide oil for 50 years. Can't we move this somewhere? You know, or we'll just make laws and take it down piece by piece. And right now, that's kind of what's happening uh, in this state because, um, you know, that is the headwater to California's water projects. The McLeod River, Sacramento River, Pitt River all fill Shasta Dam. And Shasta Dam is the pivotal point of the whole uh, Central Valley project for water of California. Right now, um, well, since the 80s, we've been fighting this again since the 80s, um, about the enlargement of Shasta Dam. They dropped it in, when they were doing the federal recognition thing, then it came back up, you know, in 2000. So since 2000, they've been investigating, it's only investigation of raising Shasta Dam anywhere from six to 200 feet. Six to 200 feet would drown those sites on our river, which we're saying, you know, um, we need to do the 106 process, we need to do, you know, ARPA, we need to do all of these things. And you will see that it's, these things cannot be moved, you know, you can't move them. It's like, can we move your puberty rock? Where would you like it? We could, it's like, <laughs> all right, you can take it to my house, I guess. <laughs> but if you take it to my house, and you also have to take the two sisters, the mountains. You have to take this river and these pools here and this dance ground over here that's all part of this puberty rock. It's put here in a cosmology setting that is in line with Mount Shasta as well as the star patterns of the moon cycles that determine when we hold these ceremonies. So can you move all that? <laughs> it's like, oh yeah, you're just trying to be facetious here. <laughs> We're trying to work with you. <laughs> do you uh, how do you get any support? Do you, um, I'm wondering about the rancherias that have embraced gambling. Do you get any money from them? Uh, I mean, it would be nice if you had some cash. To... It would be. Maybe you could talk to them. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
You know, I was I took that personally for a while, <laughs> but then I talked with uh, I talked with Orrin Lyons. I don't know if you know who Orrin Lyons is, but he's the chief, one of the chiefs of the um, Mohawk Nation, and he's a traveling chief. He he brings their word around the world. He's also very visible at the UN level and and speaks. Uh, to the forum and even in Geneva about uh, the human rights of, of tribal people and of nature. And I asked him, you know, as well as Carrie Dan, I don't know if you know who Carrie Dan is, but she's been fighting uh, the gold mines in, in uh, Nevada for 40 years for, her, for the horses. And, you know, they, uh, they canceled her <laughs> treaty it's the only treaty in the world that's been canceled for non-use. It's like, I'm here, what do you mean? I'm, I'm using this. Anyway, I asked them if the, if the uh, casino tribes, because you know, there's more, more casino tribes than just here in California. And, and Orrin Lyons told me, he says, you know, it'll be a long time before casino tribes ever wake up to this that's happening around them. It'll be a very long time. None of the big casino tribes put any money into these um, life and death trench resistance that is out here. The, the California tribes uh, will barely support our ceremonies like this. I mean, right now, Redding Rancheria um, didn't, you know, they wouldn't put anything into our ceremony. Uh, we, and we haven't asked them for a long time because it's like begging, and it's kind of be, beneath me. <laughs> Is that I have cousins on that rancheria council, right? And they'll say, well, come down, you know, we have uh, uh, some money in the culture committee. And it's like, I laugh. Culture for me. <laughs> you have, tribe has a culture committee. <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> I thought we were the culture. We should have a, a, a you know, the economic committee <laughs> or the <laughs> casino committee <laughs> you know? we don't have a culture committee with a limited little budget but uh, you know the first time we asked they gave us uh, $250 <laughs> and it was in a, a card form for Winco it's like you know what Jack this is really nice and I could buy some food and stuff but you know what we need gas to get there and we're pulling these trailers and we need to chainsaw stuff and we need these outhouses now because the Forest Service won't let us dig the pit toilets anymore. And, you know, here are, it's, food is, not, is the least of our problem. <laughs> you know, because a lot of people bring food and we have food and we, uh, it's just not one of the issues. And so then, then the next year, I sent them a, uh, a little printout thing saying, here's my request. And it was for uh, $700 for the pit toilet. I mean, the, uh, porta potties that the Forest Service was making us have, and so it we had to have at least uh, eight of them, and two of them had to be handicapped toilets. And so he goes, "You know what? I'm really sorry, but that's too much. We can't, we can't give you seven hundred dollars." It's like, "What do you mean, Jack? <laughs> you just gave fifteen thousand to the swimming pool mural on the wall." <laughs> And so uh, we haven't asked them uh, since then. They did um, about the ceremony. We did ask them, <laughs> I asked them for 50,000 to go to New Zealand to bring our salmon back, right? And he goes, how much of this do you really want? It's like, I want 50,000, Jack. <laughs> you know, you just, I know you guys just paid 50,000 for the stage at the Cascade Theater to rebuild it, and they put a little plaque on it that says it's, you know, donated by you guys. And you just did, two weeks ago, $50,000 to the recycle program in Anderson at the fairgrounds, so they get to buy new trash cans. It's like, we're talking about salmon here, Jack. <laughs> You'd think the tribe would be interested in, you know, getting the salmon back. So eventually, they voted it down, it came back on the table for my other cousins that lived down there, put it back on the table, I, we, people who voted it down were out of town, and then they, they were, weren't brave enough to give us very much, but they did give us 5,000 for our New Zealand trip. 
you know, it's like, I guess that's all right, but I expected them to um, do more. It's, it's, a tough, it's a tough thing here with the tribes, you know, the, the treatment of the tribes and, and uh, where they're going with stuff now. But I'm thinking, you know, the government does everything in like 50 to 100 year plans. And this, this whole thing about federal recognition, it's running its course and it's coming to its end because we now have, you know, uh, Cherokee people who are 14,096 Indian, right? How Indian is that? Because, um, you know, Elizabeth, Elizabeth Warren is like 1,518th Cherokee. So does that make her a woman of color? She might be running for president. Would it be on the woman of color ticket? <laughs> She's a Cherokee Indian? <laughs> it's like we're getting used at a lot of different levels. You know, everything is, is uh, out of whack. We're out of balance. The world is out of balance. California is out of balance. We're being bought out by corporations. Uh, our biggest um, person, or our biggest company about the uh, Shasta Dam is Westlands Water District, right? Westlands Water District in 2004 came up to our river and bought six, seven miles of our river to prevent any impediments to raising Shasta Dam. They are now in the uh, yes as uh, uh, funding mo uh, a lot of the Shasta Dam raise. Uh, so the other day, I was in uh, LA talking about water at the water politics, you know, the water policy 23 meeting, which all of the big water districts, except for Indians, <laughs> are, are at. And during the time that I was down there, I got a call from uh, Tom Birmingham, CEO of Westlands Water District, right? And he says, well, we were just meeting with Senator Feinstein, and Shasta Dam came up and she would like to meet with you on the river. And I'm thinking, you know, I think I talked to Peter Jensen, who is her chief of staff, who usually arranges her meetings or schedule, and then I have Westlands Water District arranging the senator's meeting with me. What does that mean? <laughs> what do you think that means? <laughs> and so then, he goes, well, you'll probably hear from Peter. I don't know. So uh, I was supposed to meet with him uh, actually uh, yesterday on the river. But he calls and says, Tom Birmingham, CEO of Westlands Water, calls back and says, uh, Senator's schedule is very full. <laughs> it's like, you would know. <laughs> <laughs> and that they'll, they'll probably call me here. Her staff will probably call me to reschedule. It's like, is he our personal uh, scheduler or what is going on there, you know? It's like, here's this big multi-billion dollar water district and the senator who's supposed to be for us, you know, for the people of the state. It's a, it's a wild kind of thing, you know, that's going on with, with all of that kind of business. But we are targets, you know? We are not, um, we're, we're playing the, the big boys game. And the big boys don't like anything in their way of their projects. We're in their way, you know? And, and we have gotten hit by that, but we're still here. And we're gonna continue to be here because, um, you know, it's kind of like the Brazilian uh, tribe that's fighting against the Belmonte Dam. What will we have left if we just walk away? We might as well shoot ourselves in the head because we'll have nothing like we did before. We already experienced what the Belmonte people will experience. We've already been there, right? Because every one of these projects has the minimum standards, the minimum water flow, the minimum number of fish that will exist, the minimum number of birds that can uh, utilize this water area. And you gotta know that there's a minimum number of the indigenous people who will survive. So on the Belmonte Dam, they say there's over 20,000 warriors how many is the minimum 
number of those warriors who will be able to live after that. Because that's calculated in there. So what about human rights? You're going to take these people like they took us, who are subsistence on the river, fishing and doing what we do on the river, and converting us to be, you know, going thrift shopping. That's what we were reduced to. That's what those people will be reduced to. Trying to find enough money to buy the water that they could get before. To buy the food that they would naturally harvest that was good for the environment before. And so they can be what, modern? <laughs> we can be real modern and have all these conveniences and have all this good food and cans and packages that we're all saying, hey, you know, give us real food. No more fillers, we're just full of fillers. <laughs> but here in California, you know, they have over-allocated the water. They've sold more, if you hear a paper water, it's when they sell these water contracts, uh, and they've sold those water contracts eight times over, about eight years ago, at 100% at delivery. So now we're in this drought, right? Obama, or President, I mean, the governor declares state of emergency for drought, right? So then he brings in President Obama, right? Obama comes here to see the drought area, and where do they take him? Fresno, right? Fresno, where the drought is. That's where the drought is, right? That's where all the water is, right? <laughs> it's the desert. <laughs> it's like, sure enough, you're standing on the desert, <laughs> there is a drought, and until you put water here, you, you transported water here and made it grow, and now that there's no water, it went back to what it was originally. It's a desert. And so you bring the president in and say, yep, by gosh, there's a drought here, there's no water here, and we got farms here, and we're planting pistachio trees, and we're growing watermelons here in the desert, and by gosh, we should bring that water back. <coughs> We've got to have more water for here. And so he brings in $600 million to the state, right, for the drought-stricken area. And so there's a, a purple line around desert. That's a drought-stricken area. That's where the 600 million is going to go, right? That's how, how it works. And in the meantime, they've drained Lake Shasta, Lake Oroville. They've drained uh, Folsom Lake to 16%. And they filled up all of their reservoirs in the south, right? They're at 100%, 80, 98%. 89%, all of their reservoirs are full. And so Metropolitan Water District reports, we're going to be fine until 2016. We have plenty of water until 2016 because we drained all of Northern California's water. It's like, so the whole state didn't get any more rain than anybody else, right? And so some people, we were in Davis last night and I said that and she goes, what? I thought it was... Folsom was just dry because it didn't rain. It's like, no, these lakes have been drawn down on contracts. That's why they're drained. And they'll continue that uh, process until something else changes. But we've had drought all the time. I mean, that's a natural occurrence. And maybe it is drought uh, will be the teacher of the lesson about water for people. Because somehow they've lost contact with water. They've lost um, their uh, appreciation of water. They've lost their water songs. They've lost their water prayers. Water is just a commodity. Most people don't even know what water tastes like. You know, it's all chemical uh, operated now. And they tell you, what rivers in California can you drink out of? Can you just walk up to the river and drink? Any that you know of? And in fact, what are you told not to do? Don't drink the water, right? And how come? You know, when, in 1850, when the people came, you could drink out of any river here. And there were more animals, there were more deer, there were more elk, there were more moose who got in the waters. <laughs> but now they tell you, oh, it's because the animals defecate in the water and it has giardia or whatever it is in it, right? It's like there were way more animals then. And you could drink out of every river, every spring, every place. Nobody had to pack water with them when they went 
hiking up the river, right? That was, that was, it was totally crazy, you know, to carry your water in. But it's not now. Backpackers carry their water in. Or they take these big filtering things and, you know, uh, try to purify the water up there so they can drink it. So nobody really knows what it tastes like anymore. So we've got to disconnect from what water is, what it does, and what's going what's gonna to happen. In, in universities like this, I always like to ask you guys. We all know that there's a finite of water, right? There's like less than 2% of the world's water is drinkable, right? Mm -hmm. And so what we need to know as the common people of the lands, how much of our water are we polluting every day or every year? Because, you know, right now they're, they're contemplating putting, well, they're doing more than contemplating. They bought uh, a place. They want to put Crystal Geyser on Mount Shasta. They'll, they will have unlimited gallons of water off of the mountain in a, uh, what they call a, a lava tube, which is, <laughs> this guy goes, it's like a river that runs down the mountain. It's like, are you totally nuts? <laughs> anyway. They have it calculated out that all of this water that's coming into this lava tube is drinkable, right? Every drop of it is drinkable. So what they're going to do is they're going to take so many thousands of gallons and put it in these bottles, and whatever comes extra, like washing the bottles and doing all of that, becomes toxic water, which will be channeled off into a new waste program that they're going to build for the city of Mount Shasta. So the city of Mount Shasta is like, yay, <laughs> we get a new sewer, <laughs> sewer system. But they don't realize that Crystal Geyser is going to fill up that sewer system with their own wastewater. Oh and why would the people of California be OK with taking half of that water that's drinkable and polluting it when we're in a drought? Why would we do that? And the drought system of the water coming through the twin tunnels, and you guys know about the twin tunnels, right? The two humongous tunnels that are big enough to divert the entire Sacramento River around the delta, and the delta is the bay, <laughs> San Francisco Bay is the delta. They have, these tunnels will be big enough to divert the entire river of the Sacramento. They, they assured me that they won't. Because <laughs> I said, my question is, can you divert the entire Sacramento River? It's like, well, we won't. It's like, why won't you? If, if, I'm asking you if, if the tunnels are big enough to divert it. And technically, yes, but we won't. We won't because we don't have a permit. <laughs> it's like, so why are you building the tunnels big enough to divert the entire river if down the road you are not banking on doing that. Why would you put in such humongous tunnels? Don't they cost more? <laughs> but that's, that's the future. That these, and you have to know, too, is that Jerry Brown has hired Westlands Water District's water planner to de develop his plan on the water system. And so you think about that. Here's a woman who uh, makes a six-figure income coming to work for the government and probably not six figures didn't follow her uh, to develop this water project for the state and then what? Um, it's 140 which is the time we said we would end. Um, uh -huh. I know that uh, we're welcome to stay here longer and maybe we could have more Q&A with, with Kelly but if people need to leave just one minute. And if you have any questions or anything. Well, one of the things I want to say, too, is that campus on campuses, you guys are so busy getting your education, and you're so busy and loaded down with different stuff, but professors need to get you involved in the current issues that are happening right now. If you haven't been to your uh, city water planning um, meetings, if you haven't been to the state board water planning meetings, uh, if you haven't looked at any of the EISs coming out on the water 
uh, you know, and it's, it's horrible too because the BDC, the Bay Delta uh, Conservation, we say it conveyance plan, it's not really conservation, is, is only like uh, 40,000 pages long. <laughs> the Shasta Dam EIR uh, pages are like 35,000. And so, you know, you're, you're swamped in uh, paperwork. And if you don't know any of the specifics or you look at, at particular parts of it, um, but the main thing would be for you to oppose it because, you know, five or ten years from now, when they're actually going through some of this stuff, then you have a right to object again. If you don't um, get in on the EISs, they say that it's much harder for you to oppose because you passed that time when you could uh, voice your uh, objections. And so I'm saying, you know, don't believe them about you have to have a scientific factual opposition as to why you oppose it. You can oppose it based on a human rights issue that says, I don't want you uh, diverting the entire Sacramento River. I don't want you destroying the delta because uh, what happens to a delta? You know, this delta is the largest one on the Western Hemisphere. Right? Did you know that? That we have the largest mm -hmm. delta, estuary. And what is an estuary? It's a nursery. It's where things grow and change and, and things that don't happen anywhere else happens there. And we have the two largest rivers of any estuary, the San Joaquin and the Sacramento, that fill this delta. And we have, we are only one of four states on the Pacific coast that actually can be wild Chinook salmon state which we were before. We were that. And remember all the cannery row all the way down, Monterey, all the way up, there was the fishing was that um, income, that was the economy of the state, began with fishing, not farming. And then farming took place, but we're talking about real farmers. And I say real farmers because real farmers don't get all the subsidies. They don't get their tractor replaced. They don't get, you know, they have to fight for their seeds. They have to, <laughs> they're going down every day, the farmers. Ag business is not farming. And that's what the people of the state have to get some definitions. Is that the people, the farmers, are not, should not be against the fish. <laughs> the fish are not really saying, I'm going to get you guys. <laughs> Just wait till my next lawsuit. <laughs> But the fish, the, the Chinook salmon, we believe, are the indicators of how healthy our water systems are. Both in the ocean to the high mountain streams is the, as how healthy they are. They are climate changers. They're the ones who uh, turn the rocks. They change the temperatures of the water. They clean and, and take care of the riverbeds. They bring all the nutrients up for the trees and everything else and then they take it back out to sea, their job is never done. And we say that they are magical, miracle fish because they only do it one time. One time is the only time that they do it. They come up the river only once in their life. They spawn, they all die. And when they all die, they die before the, the young salmon are hatched. When the young salmon are hatched, they are swimming with all the other fish and all the other aquatic life there. And then all of a sudden they get this urge to go downstream. Nobody else is going downstream. Nobody says, hey, um, you know, I'm a trout and I think you guys got to go downstream. <laughs> You're in my way. <laughs> I'm staying, but see ya. <laughs> you know, nothing else is going to go downstream. But all of a sudden they decide they're going downstream. And they start going downstream and they go and go until they uh, enter other waters. You know, McLeod R River comes into the Sacramento, the Pitt River. They go down. All of these other tributaries start coming into the Sacramento. Other rivers start coming into the Sacramento. Feather River, uh, American River, all of them. And they keep coming downstream. And when they get to the estuary, they find out that they are freshwater fish. And that's saltwater, right? 
And so they don't say, you know, I think we made a mistake. <laughs> you better go back up <laughs> where we belong <laughs> and live out our life up there. For some reason, they stay, they hang out, they change in that estuary and that nursery into saltwater fish. And they go out to sea. They know that they're supposed to go out to sea, right? And they're out there anywhere from four to seven years. And again, something tells them, well, time to go upstream. It's like, but not any stream will do. We have to come back and we have to find the exact same estuary that we came out of. If you came out of uh, up the coast, or you came out of down the coast, or you came out of uh, the bay, you have to find that exact same estuary. If you're in Alaska, they all swim together in the ocean. And so as they decide they have to go home, they have to go back and find that exact same estuary. And so when they get to the estuary, they're adult salmon now, right? And of course they're kind of small now, but they used to be up to 80, 100 pound fish. And they would come into the estuary and they would find that they are saltwater fish. Mm -hmm. And they're trying to go up freshwater waterway. So they again need this estuary to change. And even in that change, uh, their jaws will even change. Uh, a structural change will happen to them as they uh, get ready to go upstream. But it, they don't say, you know what, I'm adult, you know, and you know what, I love the ocean. I'm just not prepared to do that change. <laughs> Maybe next year. <laughs> I'm going back out. They don't say that, right? So they go through this change and they start upriver. And now we have so many obstacles in the river, but it used to be a lot better uh, for them to come upriver. But even then, if we had a, a drought situation or uh, logs were in the river or different things could uh, impede their progress, they don't say, you know, here we are at this at the American River and, man, I'm really tired. <laughs> I think I'm just going to go right up here and spawn. <laughs> it's like, no, they have to find the exact river that they're from. So McLeod River salmon can't decide to go up the Feather River because they're tired or it's too far or we don't really remember. I, well, I was just a little fry when we came down. <laughs> <laughs> I need a map. How am I going to get back there? I don't know. But they do, so they keep going. McLeod River salmon are at the tip of the whole salmon run. And so they have to swim in the farthest. And when they, they go up, they get there, and the whole process starts again. And so we say that they are magical fish. The reason that they know these things is because they're still connected to the Creator. And the Creator continues to, to work through them to help us understand those connections. Mm -hmm. And that our, our issues with the fish and with the water must always be maintained. And somehow, you know, as people, we've kind of stepped away from that. We're greater than water. We can command water. We can control water. We can clean up water. But we can't make water. So on this brown water plan, do you think that we have enough water in the world to afford two more fracking mines. Oh. Can we afford two more fracking mines for energy? Because this is, this is it, right? It's energy or water. And so if we have enough water, maybe that's not such a bad idea. Because we have to keep up this lifestyle that's eventually going downstream, right? It's going down the hill. Because if you haven't recognized, we are in extreme mining conditions. When we're doing tar sands, those are extreme mining. It's not like oil's gushing up from the ground anymore. It's doing the things that they didn't want to do before because they were too dangerous to do. And now we're doing them at the expense of water in the world for a process that is dying. It's like Westland's Water District land. You can't grow anything on that land anymore. It's a desert. You put water on it, it grew for a while, but now the selenium is coming up. And the more water you put on it, because it's a desert, the more selenium is going to come up. And the more selenium comes up, they overflow it, they flood it, and it, it poisons the other um, clay aqu aquifers. 
And so you're poisoning more water by putting water. It's like, it's the end of growing in the desert there. Maybe they should move the Death Valley and try it there. Because they got too much salt in, in the Westlands Water District. And they get paid, like I say, they get paid for not growing because they threaten to grow. So the government pays them not to grow. They get their allocations at um, subsidy rates, which is like $20 a square uh, an acre foot of water. They turn around and sell that from anywhere from $600 to $1,500 per acre foot to uh, cities and towns down below them. There's off of the uh, brown water plan, there's the two lines that go to fracking. There's five lines that go out into the desert for new communities that aren't here yet. For the five million people who are supposed to move to California. So they're going to put them on a lifeline water uh, cord in the desert where if anything happens to that water line, all those people are be uprooted or die. Right? So it's not really uh, good planning that's happening. It's not that they're going to give more water to LA because you know they want the North and the South to be fighting each other, you know, over LA, San Diego, the water uses. You know, we think, oh yeah, they got all those swimming pools and they got all those golf courses and da da da. But in reality, um, the su the in Southern California, they uh, pretty much are at a flat line water use even though they have a more population than we do up here in the north, uh, they have maintained a pretty much uh, level water use. They have a better educational system than we have about water use. They have, um, they have a lot of things that we should have. I mean, Sacramento uses twice as much or more water than LA mm -hmm. because we're not you know, water sensitive. <laughs> in the north, we don't, we don't connect with uh, how important that is or or the, maybe the rates, but everybody in the state will pay for the Rays of Shasta Dam, and everybody in the state will pay for the Twin Tunnels, whether or not you, uh, are, comp you are benefit beneficiary of that particular project. It's a state project and a federal project, and everybody will pay for it. The Shasta Dam is still not paid for from its original building, and so now it'll go up, you know, uh, and I think right now they're talking about the, the tunnels costing anywhere from um, 30 to 56 billion dollars. And the Shasta Dam is considered a, what uh, Tom Birmingham says, shovel ready project. <laughs> and it's at uh, probably about 2 billion. They want to build Sites Reservoir, which is by Williams, uh, and has, Sites Reservoir has no streams or rivers to fill it. It will be filled by the Sacramento River. Mm -hmm. And Shasta Dam will be that component that uh, gives the Sacramento a little bit more water to store into sites. And sites will be that um, holding tank. But everybody will pay for it. And right now in uh, the Central, Central Valley area, Bakersfield, um, Stockton area, there are communities there like Alpa who have arsenic in their water systems and a number of other nitrates that they cannot drink their tap water. They're paying for their tap water, but they can't drink their tap water. You know, uh, uh, a couple of years ago now, the human right to water bill, we were pushing that. Everybody has a human right to water. But even working with that group, it's like human right to water has to be more than just what's coming in the tap, what's coming in the pipes, and going out of the pipes. We have to look you know, at Mount Shasta. If you look at Mount Shasta right now, you look at Lassen, you look at uh, even uh, Whitney, and you see the snow is not there. We have ridge lines. We have uh, exposure of ridges that you can see that are rock. That's drought. That's where the drought is on that mountain because all of the water that goes to the Westlands, to Fresno, comes from there. Fresno is not the drought area. You know, Redding and all around up there is the drought area. The Sierras are the drought area. And we are doing nothing for the high mountain meadows. We're not bringing the beaver back. We're not bringing the wolf back. These are all water keepers of the high mountain meadows. And we're not, um, we're not there, and I say beavers because our mountain streams, when a stream runs in one bed forever, it cuts down into the ground, right? 
And so it doesn't, it doesn't meander anymore. It cuts into the ground and then it goes off like a gun barrel, right? A fire hydrant. All the water is, is shot off down through that, uh, that um, ditch. It becomes a ditch. But when beavers are in the area and they build these dams, the dams in the wintertime break at different places. And so the river moves, the, the stream beds move over and it runs this year. It'll break over here and it'll run this year. And so it never has a chance to cut deep down into the ground like it is. So there's lots of jobs that need to be made in restoration of high mountain meadow and stream beds. That's where the jobs are. Jobs are not uh, growing Manzano food for the world. You know, they're gonna feed the world, right? But what if we fed the world salmon? Wouldn't that be so much healthier and better? And you know, and, and we're not cutting off our omega-3s and replacing it with the frankenfish, you know? <laughs> Everybody be eating frankenfish pretty soon. Any other questions or? Uh, Uh, there's so many dots to connect, you know, it's all, it's all connected. Um, but um, one piece I'm interested in um, is regarding the all the way downstream to the farmers who, because of the twin, because of the raising the dam and the twin tunnels and the draining of the Sacramento and the Delta, <laughs> and then they can't farm, and so they're getting an allotment of water, and then they're selling it to the frackers? Is that what you're saying? Okay, that, that's what I'm saying. So, just to, to be really clear, how, how exactly does that work? Because I want to be able to tell other people. Yeah, you know, I don't. It, it's a it's a hard thing because Westlands Water District. You, you really can't name what they are. Are they a state agency? Are they a private agency? Are they a public water district? Are they you know because they bought land on the McLeod River, which is a fishing club. How does a, a water district? if they have a board of directors and they have, they're representing the public, agree to buy a fishing club. It's like, Sounds is fishy. that for training or <laughs> what? <laughs> but, and then when you go to this fishing club, which is called the Bali Baka up on our river, and we have access to it still, we've had access, they haven't blocked us yet, but all of the vehicles that are on that property are government uh, plate vehicles. And so it's like, are they a government agency? It's like, how do they get government plates on the McLeod River from a water district that's 400 miles away? And what are they? Are they, you know, and there, there he is, he's sitting in Feinstein's office, worried about us on the McLeod to make a meeting. It's like, is he a government man or is he CEO of a water district or is he, is that a private agency? What is it? <laughs> we can't figure it out. It's like, it's a chameleon, it just changes, <laughs> can't see it. But they do, um, and that's what we ask the Bureau of Reclamation too, is, is that on your water project, why does the water have to stop at Westlands? Why don't you just allocate it out to the municipal uh, water districts as it goes along, and that the state manage those programs so that these towns are not paying, you know, $1,500 an acre foot. You know, um, in Tuolumne, they were they had zero allocations this in the last couple of months. They were going to get zero allocations. They had enough water for like four more weeks or something for their town. The Tuolumne tribe um, used its first-in-time water rights to allocate more water and became the town's um, partner in getting the water for everybody in that area. But, you know, Westland's Water District was not going to let go of anything. But they did, they did manage. It's like, you kind of wonder, what's happening in the state capitol, you know, what they, they would cut off a community when they're saying, you know, we're in, we're in an emergency drought issue, real for real here. But, see, the governor also has the Human Right to Water Bill, and he allocated $4 million to the Human Right to Water Bill. And what they did was for the Alpa and Seville and some of those other towns in, in that area, they um, contracted with water bottling companies to bring them water, right? So these water bottling companies have just 
transferred into a necessity and not such a luxury in these situations. Because we're not putting any of that money into um, the infrastructure. All of the towns up and down the state need new pipes. Many of them are old lead pipes. Many of them are, have cracked pipes. We lose a lot of water in, in that uh, system. In Reading, uh, a pipe broke under the city and about 100 million gallons of water flowed through it before they could find what was the problem. And they fixed that pipe. But where is all of the allocation that says that's an indicator that this whole thing is falling apart? We should fix it. And we should upgrade our sewer systems because these sewer systems were only uh, expected to function for a certain population level. That population has outgrown the sewer systems. And so in the wintertime, those ponds fill up and they release that water into the Sacramento River and everywhere that they are going uh, before it's time. And so we're releasing, it's like, oh, don't worry, so many parts per billion. <laughs> you should, should be fine. You know, every town's releasing all the way down. It's like, I'm glad I'm at the top. <laughs> <laughs> at the top of that scale. <laughs> but there's a lot of things to think about. There's a lot of issues. Um, we have a website, uh, um, uh, us that you can go on. We have some petitions there. We would appreciate your support on. Uh, we have um, different uh, events that are coming up. I don't know how many of you heard, uh, went to the fracking, anti-fracking rally at um, the Capitol where uh, pretty much 4,000 people came and I don't think the governor found us. <laughs> right after the, <laughs> right after the uh, Congressman LaMalfa in my district, right? He calls all around everywhere trying to find me, supposedly, can't find me. The day before I was speaking at the Capitol steps. <laughs> and we have a website, we have email, and we <laughs> but he calls all around to find me, you know, and finally finds me. He found somebody else who was supposed to go to his meeting, but they called me. <laughs> so I showed up at his meeting and he apologized for not being able to find me. <laughs> and uh, said that he wanted to come out to the river because you know we do have an act of Congress that was supposed to have uh, given us like land to live on, on the river. Uh, 1941, the act of Congress was passed and um, they were supposed to give us like land, they were supposed to move our cemeteries and they were supposed to help us with the infrastructure to start over. Mm -hmm. And none of those things occurred. They moved our cemetery but they never gave it to us. So now they're allowing everybody uh, to bury you there, and we're supposed to be the beneficiaries of that act. And of course, uh, when Governor, I mean, the Congressman uh, Herger was in forever, like 28 <laughs> years he was the Congressman, he said, because uh, we asked him about the act of Congress and how he could help us, and he goes, Well, you know. We only pass those acts, we don't enforce them. <laughs> it's like, well, who enforces them? <laughs> who does that part? Because it's a law, it's a law, right? It hasn't been rescinded. It's one of the laws uh, that created this Central Valley Water Project. But when you look at the information out there, they fail to list that act. And it's like, kind of makes you wonder why did they fail to list that act? <laughs> because they stole our land, that's why. We are still the original owners of the land under Shasta Lake and they have not taken it away from us legally. They just flooded it, that's all. But they don't want to talk about that. But in Feinstein, you know, she's against any Indians becoming a casino tribe. <laughs> and so it's like, well, which is fine with us because we're not a casino tribe, never wanted to be. My grandma said if we become one, uh, it'll destroy us from the inside out. And uh, and then, you know, Grayton did what they did with Wolseley and, and, and Boxer, that they uh, got on as a writer and said that they wouldn't do a casino, and then they did, 
And so then Wolseley and all, all of them are saying, well, the Indians lied to us. It's like, first time? <laughs> it's like, how many times have you lied to the Indians? <laughs> and they didn't do anything illegal. I mean, if it was legal to do, uh, they did it, even though they changed our mind you know, about the casino. So um, I don't know what we do here in the state. You know, I think it's up to the good people of the state to start waking up, go to these meetings, especially uh, young people. You go to these water meetings, and I swear, all of the water meetings I go to, uh, I look around and I'm probably the only woman. And everybody else, the majority of the people in that room are old, bald, white guys, you know, <laughs> a 60 or better, who are farmers and are going to stay that until, you know, their last dying day. And they have every right to water and not fish. The fish are, um, you know, it's like that one guy goes, that little delta smelt. <laughs> the little delta smelt's really in our way. It's like, it's like they only killed 99% of them already. <laughs> They're after that last percent. That last little smelt. <laughs> and it's the only place in the world that they grow is here in this delta. <laughs> They're like us, you know, and the salmon need the delta smelt. And so it, it all is connected, you know, and people don't realize that it's all connected that the water in the world is all connected. You know, when they're talking about uh, doing something Mount Shasta and digging or drilling into those lava tubes, that affects the delta all the way down, you know. It affects the water supply because nobody knows what's inside of a volcano mountain, right? Have they taken it apart before? Are there scientists who really understand what's inside of that mountain? They don't. My grab says, that if you, if you poke a hole in this kind of a mountain and you knock through a lava tube, all of that water could just disappear and go somewhere else. You don't even know where it goes. It's like a big puzzle in there, she says. And that's the mountain we're supposed to have come out, in, out of as our home place, our, the place of our um, creation story is from the inside of that mountain, from the sacred fire in that mountain that we came out through that spring and this is why we are um, the caretakers of this area, is, is because of that in our connection there. And so, you know, we're, we're not looking to, to go somewhere else in the world and, you know, pick up a new life. <laughs> and I heard that some people are going to Mars. <laughs> water, water on Mars. <laughs> Um, you probably already said this, but I'm, maybe it came in too late to hear it. What exactly do we do to oppose all of this stuff? Do we like write to the governor, or what do we do? Um, I'm Give us thinking, an action. Yeah, action plan. Um, and that's a, that's a hard thing to do. You know, We're just people, and most of us don't have too much money, and we don't have too much time. And we don't understand this 35,000 pages of gibberish. Um, but I think that we have to show up, and we have to stand up at these meetings. We have to be visible. Our young people have to come out and, and demand a better future. How do we know when the meetings are taking place? Did you already say that? No. <laughs> I have a hard time. It's like I, uh, one of my federally recognized cousins <laughs> sent me an email yesterday saying that the Department of Water Resources is holding a tribal meeting in Corning, which is in my area, and never told me. <laughs> it's like, why don't they tell me? I go to all these meetings, I sign up on all their little email information stuff, and I get after them every time. It's like, how come you're not telling me? You know, you know where we are, you've come up on our river, we showed you our sacred sites, and you still fail to let me know and you know I'm going to find out, and then I'm going to be mad. <laughs> and it just happens over and over, you know. But I think that if you go, um, go on the uh, Department of Water Resources, there's a number of meetings that they post. And then if you go on the Capital Water, um, water Workshops, they also have, it's like they, will, they are holding workshops everywhere at the same time down the block. <laughs> Because I think it's like a chaos, like over inundate you. It's like, which one should I go to? I'd just like to add that the comment period for the tunnel disaster is until June 12th, I think. 
Then yeah. where do you yeah. leave a con? How do you do and that? Go. You can go online. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. You can go online and uh, for the Delta BDC, and uh, they'll have a whole thing where you can read it or uh, comment. I don't know if you can see other people's comments because we have comments in there already, and so does uh, like the Golden Gate Salmon Association has their comments on the Bay Delta plans. I think that you can somehow see other people's comments. Delta BBC, what is it? Is that what you said? Delta? Yeah, the Bay, De Bay Delta Conservation Plan. Yeah, Bay Delta Conservation Plan. There's also... Or um, conveyance plan. <laughs> <laughs> I can chat with you after if you'd like to. Cause they yeah. Big... But that's, that would be my, my take on it is like, even if you can get some of your professors to allow you credit in some way, if you're in environmental or fish or plants or soci sociology or psychology or you know whatever it is, you can relate it to water. You know, you know families can't live without water. Education can't happen without water. You know, nothing can happen without water. And so I'm thinking that you could, um, as young people, you know, try to show up at these places because you're missing. You're missing in action. And it's all taking, it's all going down, and by the time you look around, all of the uh, billionaires are going to own all of the water. They're shifting, you know, and they have been shifting in this last 15 years, 20 years. You know, um, Warren Buffett bought le uh, water on the Klamath. Um, mm. W.C. Fields is buying water. Um, the Ogallala aquifers were bought up. The river, Westlands Water District is a world-renowned water district. It's not just a little tinky thing in Fresno, just in California, water agency. It is a world-renowned, it's like Nestle's. They are world-renowned, and they're taking water everywhere. And um, they have bought, like I say, the seven miles of river on the McLeod. They've bought um, river miles on the American, the Feather, uh, and who knows where else. But in that, they're also trying to change uh, policy at the government level that says that since it's their waterfront, they have, on the McLeod, they have a, a gauge now to gauge how much water goes by that seven miles of their property. And claiming, and what they're going to do is they're going to claim that as their water that's stored in Shasta Lake and by gosh, it should be released for Westlands Water District because that's their water. Mm -hmm. And that is right now being uh, tossed around at the Senate um, level in California. They don't have the law in place yet, but they are certainly actively working on it. And people just don't know, you know, what's going on. But water is the, the, the war that's going on right now, it, and it will only get more vicious as it goes. Yeah. Has there been any... Um laws proposed like to stop the private ownership of water? You know what that That's I, a really tough one. Right? Yeah, I don't think so. Okay. I don't think so because anybody can can uh, open a water bottling plant, you know, and that's kind of private ownership of water. Uh, even even on the McLeod, you know, it's like uh, the Forest Service will come back and say, well, you know, we can't do any surveys because that's private land. It's like, but the water is not private land. <laughs> the river, and we're saying our sacred places are in the water. <laughs> we have sacred pools, we have rocks, we have places that are in the water that's sacred. We're not talking about that man's private, you know, um, land area. So it would be interesting to see, you know, how much of that is happening or going down that way of, of uh, private private water owners, because, um, I don't know, it seems like pretty soon it'll be private air owners. Private water owners, private air. Uh, I <coughs> think it's probably, for now, pretty unreasonable to people that want to make money, but also there could be an idea of, of maybe not giving back all the land. I mean, I think we should give all the land back to the people that live here and still live here. but. To at least give the rights to all the resources. Like, let's say somebody wants to, somebody from a tribe wants to go 
harvest a special herb from a place or uh, some some resource, rocks, whatever, or water that's not their land, you know, legally. Yeah. Um, and to let them have that right to go and harvest. That would be nice. It would be. Uh... <laughs> Well, that's what we say on the McLeod. It's like, no matter who owns this land, we were here, these places were put down here for us. These are sacred places. Nobody can really own them. And that we're supposed to come and sing to them. We're supposed to come here and dance for this. And no matter who owns it, you know, that's what needs to be done. Are you guys going to do it? <laughs> but, uh, but like you're saying, too, it's the MLPAs, you know, on the, the coastline for uh, tribes that are gatherers on the coastline, there's there's a whole issue that's happening with that as well at the same time on the water issues, you know. So there's just a lot of a lot of things uh, that people don't understand the relationship, like I was talking about uh, the um, coastal tribes gather mussels off of the coastline, right? And they gather these mussels in a certain way. And if they're not gathered, the mussels start building up um, towers. And so when the storm waters come in, they just break off these uh, sections of mussels, and then there aren't any. But if you, it's like pruning a bush, you know, it's taking care of them in that way so that they continue to be mussels all the time. But if you don't, then they, they go out of balance and they get wiped out by the effects of the ocean. Right? So we're part of that balancing mechanism that's in place. And for the unrecognized tribes right now, there's no mechanism in place that says how we're doing. They don't count us. They don't know what our teen suicide rates are. They don't know what our uh, health rates are. They don't know what our birth rates are. They don't know what our educational levels are. There's no mechanism that says, oh, we better um, pay attention to these unrecognized people. Because... Um, you know, those laws for Indian people, like uh, the Indian Child Welfare Act, the uh, Indian Religious Freedoms Act, none of those apply to us. Okay? None of those apply to us. But we continue to have the cultural barriers that those laws were based on to establish new laws. It's not like there's not low-income health services, right? But because of cultural barriers and beliefs in a different way of health care, it has prevented Indians from accessing the low-income health care. So Indian Health Services was established to reach the community because too many of them were waiting until a death-dying day, right, to go in. And so now the unrecognized tribes are at that place again where they're not accessing the health care until it's too late. If you'd come in like six weeks earlier, we got a cop this like that. If you'd come in a year before, you know, we could have done these kinds of things. But it's not happening. You know? So there's no mechanisms to indicate how healthy or how, how to help a society. So we're, we are uh, the latchkey uh, society in California. And, and it's not just Winnemum, but it's 90% of the Indians in California. There's over 300,000 Indians in California. Only 38,000 are eligible for those services. The rest of us have to fight to hold our ceremonies. We have to fight to uh, be who we are. We have no assistance with language or anything else that uh, other tribes have. We can't even apply for the EPA Save the Fish Monies. Right, and so those are those are issues that um, you know we will be writing to uh, the U United Nations on the uh, elimination of racial discrimination because we believe that this is racial discrimination when they prevent us or block us from trying to hold our own ceremonies that make us the distinctive people that we are, and so um, you know there's a, there's just a a lot of issues, but you know, now uh, I was trying to get my son to do a, a GPS. We did a GPS of all of our sacred sites that will be flooded because of Shasta Dam raised at six foot or at 18 and a half feet. 
And now I want, now I'm thinking, well, we need to do a GIS on all of the uh, little critters that also will be inundated by this. You know, the river otter <laughs> don't really live in the lake as well as they live in the river, and that the lake over, overflows the river, they lose their habitat. And so it's like, please, little river otter, please save us. <laughs> <laughs> or that would the, be a good uh, good project for a student to do, to volunteer and get college credit for. Yeah, that would be good too. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, so uh, uh, any other questions or comments? Or We have other films out if you want. Um, Kat, we, oh, we have uh, Dancing Salmon Home back there, which is our, our efforts to bring the salmon back from New Zealand that we sent there in 1910, uh, uh, thereabouts, and uh, New Zealand had no salmon, now they have our salmon. But now uh, the Bureau of Reclamation says that, uh, you know, there's no DNA to prove that those are your salmon. Even though there's plenty of documentation that they left our river, uh, it was verified, they got on a ship, they went to New Zealand, they got off the ship, it's all documented. Uh, the New Zealand people indicate that, yeah, we did get that, river, that from your river. Um, and they, we also sent trout to that same place. And uh, because we still have rainbow trout, they're able to positively prove that the trout in New Zealand are the exact DNA trout of the McLeod River. But since we don't have any more salmon, there's no DNA. And so a DNA wizard, he says, well, do you have like an old bone? <laughs> do you have an old fish bone? <laughs> and then we could match the DNA. It's like New Zealand is one of the countries now that have the biggest um, business of fish, right? They sell over $84 billion of salmon business. That should be California. They came from here, we, they weren't even over there. <laughs> and now they're the country selling the most salmon. And we're not. You know, it's, it's crazy that we're not. Since we are the best suited for, you know, millions of fish. And we're just not, we're not taking advantage of it. So anyway, we got that movie. It's 66 minutes long. There is also some parts that are... Um, that provide documentation for educational programs and things that could be worked with some more. There's another uh, film out called uh, Standing on Sacred Ground, and it talks about eight different communities around the world that are fighting for their sacred places, including a section on the, the tar sands of Canada, uh, Hawaii and the Kohalabi, taking back the island of Kohalabi that got bombed mm -hmm. all the time as practice, and uh, Papua New Guinea, uh, Australia, uh, Somalia, Peru are all part of this uh, comparison of, of people, including us, are in, in that film. And then there's another one called, called uh, Thirsty for Justice. It's made by the Bay Delta uh, community. It talks about the tunnels. It talks about the water projects. Uh, we're in it also to talk about the headwaters of, of the whole project. Um, and then there's also another one called um, Over Troubled Waters, another Bay Delta about uh, the effects of what's going to happen to the Delta. So those are, those are current um, uh, videos. The Dancing Salmon Home and Standing on Sacred Ground has, have won uh, several, several awards in the film festival so far and are, are actually very good films. And it's just a slice in time. You know, this is just where we are now. I, I always say, you know what, we're all creating history here. We're in the midst of this history of what's going to happen to our water. And when we get to the end of that, uh, we need to say that we participated, that we did all that we could to what we believe should happen. And if we didn't, then, you know, we missed it. It's not going to happen again. But we need to think about these things uh, right now for future generations, and, I'm, and I say that because future generations are already here, right? We talk about seven generations long. I'm the end of a seven generation thought.
process that brought that started seven generations before me. So I'm standing here at the end of that seventh generation. And this is what we have. You know, we still have nothing. <laughs> we used to have more back there. <laughs> but now I'm at the beginning of another seven generations down the line from me. You know, my daughter has been born. She doesn't have any kids yet. But that's one generation, right? And so we have these next generations that I care about. And so we need to do, uh, we need to think smart about water. Water is not replaceable. Man cannot make water. You know, they talk about, oh, let's just convert the entire ocean, we'll desal, right? It's like, then what happens to the ocean? You know, it's not a mistake that the Creator put things in a certain way. <laughs> and the ocean has so much salt water because it's supposed to, right? So what if we extract all the fresh water out of the ocean and then we leave more salt, right? You know, we, we just create more problems <laughs> as we go along with these big thinkers um, to, to resolve the issue instead of looking at ourselves and saying, what is it that we could do differently? Can we design our systems a little more efficient? I mean, how many people turn on the hot water and wait? All this water going down the sink, right? We're waiting for it to turn hot. Can we do something about that? <laughs> Can we divert all that water as it's going out into another tank that says, okay, we'll use that for uh, flushing the toilet, or we'll use that for washing uh, the dishes, or we'll do, use that in our machines? Something. But it's just going down the sink, going out the, up the sewer and down, down the line as we're waiting for the hot water. You know, there have to be some things that we can change. To, to revert things, you know, and it's, it's like tub water. Can we use tub water or, or shower water then to flush the toilet too? Can we move that from that to another tank that just flushes the toilet? You know, how many ways can we use water before we just send it, send it out to the sewer pond? You know, we're sending drinking water out to the sewer pond. We have the technology to design better communities, self-sufficient communities, if we can think beyond dams, which is an archaic way to store water because it causes greenhouse gases. You know, there's 60 foot of toxic waste at the bottom of Shasta Dam. The, the fish are mercury poisoned. It sits on an earthquake fault line. It's like, how many things do we need to tell us this is a mistake? Why build it higher? Oh yeah, that's the bright idea was to build it higher. <laughs> because the toxic waste, we've stopped that problem, right? No, it's going to continue to build up. We know that it's there, so we're counting on future generations to be smart enough to neutralize all of these poisons, and it's not just in Shasta, because this was a mining state, right? Everywhere they mined, they opened up the earth and it bleeds. And when it bleeds, it's the poison. You know, there's in our area we have a Superfund site that they use hydro mining, cut off this mountain, and iron pours out of it, in every rainy season, they, they try to contain Iron Canyon, and when it rains, the ponds overflow, and the ponds go right into the Sacramento River. It's like, can we not learn from some of these things? And can, don't, don't we have technology now? And I think that we do, but we, we don't want to use it because, you know, in the 70s, they came up with a car that ran off of, of water, and that patent was bought up like that, right? Oil industry took that up, they have a stash somewhere. You think they're buying up water for nothing? They're gonna run the cars that should have been running since the 70s on it. They have the technology. We should be building communities, you know, we're having these farmer's markets, right? Organic farming, farmer's markets, so we can buy good food, real food. Why don't we build organic communities in, along with that, right? Why don't we establish organic communities that have fruit trees and, and food and vegetables all through the, and no, no uh, fertilizer, and start maintaining these things into a sewer system that um, can create water like Mother Nature did before. It changes it back into usable water. We don't have to have sewer ponds that dump into the river. These sewer ponds should be at the end of it where fish can live. And they have that technology. They have all of that available. You know, they have designs of houses that use less energy. They have designs of houses that you have lighting without turning the lights on. 
You know, we have all of that. Why do we have all of that if we're not going to use it? If we just want to hang on to this archaic way that pipelines to Westlands so we can pay Westlands for an inefficient end program of all life. You know, it's crazy. It's crazy. Why, why, uh, why do people go to school if they're not going to listen to them? <laughs> At the end of it, you know. And change to, so that people can live on. You know, I just saw the other day that uh, the Canuck brothers, they are worth $100 billion. Can you believe that? Why would somebody, why is that a good thing to be worth $100 billion? It's like, how many things did you destroy? How many, uh, what, what did you do to get that? And then it's like these other guys, you know, they get that rich, they get retired, and then they start handing it back out, like Bill Gates, right? He's handing some money out. It's like, it'd be nice if you didn't even make that money and you left this stream alone and you left that mountain alone and you, you didn't kill all those things. But it is, it is that way now, you know. They have a farm in uh, Arizona where they raise uh, white buffalo. And people go there to kill a white buffalo because there are no more white buffaloes. <coughs> but they want it, they want that experience and to have a white buffalo on their wall. You know, and I think that uh, here in California we're we're getting down to the last salmon runs. You know, we've we've destroyed most of the runs already. There are only a couple of runs that um, are still diminishing, but they say they're okay. And who's gonna pay? the most money to catch the last salmon. Yeah, if you have the last salmon, uh, you, you'll probably be rich. If you have the last salmon and somebody wants to catch it. It seems like it goes that way. And it seems like we can't stop until we get there. It's like mining, mining for gold. We couldn't stop until you know, there was no more gold, right? And we took the big trees, giants, uh, hundreds of years old trees, and we cut them down until there was only a handful left. We couldn't stop. We had to have it. It was money making. It was the economy. If we stopped, we'd, our economy would just fall flat. You know? And so we cut them until there was no more. And the trapping. We trapped all the animals until there weren't any more. Now they're endangered. We've developed endangered species because we did it. We killed them. And so now, here we are on oil. You know? And how does that work? It, it uh, kind of reminds me of the Winnie the Pooh story, you know, um, where he's, he's uh, got Christopher Robin to blow him up a balloon and he's going up into the tree to get the honey. And he takes, uh, he's full of honey, and then he says to Christopher, because Christopher Robin's walking back and forth saying, oh, it looks like rain, because he wants to look like a little rain cloud. He doesn't want the bees to know he's a little rain cloud. And so then he's done, he's full, and he, uh, Christopher says, well, come, we'll let go and come down, you know. He goes, I can't, I can't let go. You'll have to use your slingshot and shoot the balloon. It's like Christopher goes, well, it's the same result. You're gonna fall, so just let go. He goes, I can't let go. But that's how we are. We can't let go of what they say we need. We need this economy, we need this dam, we need this the way it is. We need it, we can't think outside of that box. You know? And that's where we have to dare to go. We have to dare to think that we'll survive. We'll survive without a poison chasta dam. <laughs> we did before, we will again. And we could survive on salmon. Water would be a lot better, there'd be more of it. It'd be less polluted. But we're at that place where, you know, um, like my grandpa said, um, we're, at a, we're at the tipping edge of maybe, it, maybe uh, we go all the way over and people will live on, but it won't be like this no more. And we can't sustain what we're doing. <coughs> like on a, on a train to go over the cliff, that's when we're jumping on. It's like, yeah, I want to be on it. <laughs> okay, if anybody else has any questions or... Uh, I appreciate it being here and I uh, hope that you guys will all be able to do something in your own communities and show up at those meetings and uh, give them a hard time, ask them hard questions. <laughs>
do some investigation. There's a lot of stuff online. Like I say, uh, we on our site we have petitions. We'd appreciate you signing our petition so that when we do get the meet with Senator Feinstein, we can say all of these people, you know, believe that the Shasta Dam should not be built higher. It's not the answer to the way that we think about water, the way that we use water. There's so many other things that we could do, and that's where the jobs should be. We should be building uh, technological plumbing <laughs> and, and putting in the, the correct things, because even the plastic pipes are, are uh, starting to show up as bad for us. You know? So there must be some jobs out there that create environments that are safe and healthy. Okay, thank you.